Uh, also, can I ask, is there a time, like a, a, a time frame or duration that you're aiming for or just kind of going with the flow or what? I just go with the flow. Usually we sort of sort of cap it around about, you know, an hour and 30 minutes, but we'll just, just see, where, see where it goes, mate. If it's, if we, uh, great, great. If it goes, if, yeah, if we sort of just let the conversation be its own thing. And uh, we should actually be live now. Um, so hopefully uh, people can can hear what we're saying. But uh, yeah, mate, how are you doing? Great. It's great to be here. This is actually, Rob, this is my first ever YouTube live appearance. Have I popped your cherry, Jonas? <laughs> Thank you. It is, it is, I, no one, no one I'd rather, I'd rather do it with. <laughs> blessed <laughs> cheers dude it's such a cool a cool format though i started playing with it a while ago and it's just so much um more kind of like interactive than you know and so much more kind of like spontaneous than than the kind of recording something and then going back to because whenever i do that i always feel um then you've got to like record intros for it and maybe you want to trim right. some little bits out of it whereas this is just kind of so instant you just sit there and press a button and yeah and, and sort of go for it and uh it just kind of fits nicely, especially in like a kind of a midweek slot like this, where you can just, yeah, just just sit down and have a sort of a nice, relaxed conversation with with, a, with an old friend. And uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's I'd recommend it, mate. It's worth worth playing around with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I mean last time I spoke to you, I mean it was I think about about eighteen months ago, wasn't it? It was around about February twenty twenty, just before the world exploded and uh the before times <laughs> yeah, yeah mate yeah mate with a more a more innocent time some might say but um yeah i mean i i, I think just then when we spoke last time you were about to d go on facilitate at, the, at this mushroom retreat so i mean there's, there's a few yep. different things i want to get into in this conversation I'm, you know the, the, the yeah. topic around all these kind of the you know, these ancient civilizations and stuff which is really juicy to get into but let's just catch up first mate like, like how did what happened with you with around your retreating stuff and how did how did that go and did you get caught up in this whole um covid yeah, thing yeah 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 well Thanks for asking. Yeah, I do remember like right after I had arrived back to Jamaica, um, that was when I uploaded like our last conversation on my channel. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been working at a, at a, a psilocybin retreat center in Jamaica. It's called Myco Meditations. Uh, down in Jamaica, psilocybin mushrooms as well as a number of psychedelics are completely legal. So we have an incredible team of, of you know highly trained facilitators, of therapists and, and uh, registered nurses on every retreat. And yeah, oh, it's, 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 it's been such an, such an amazing experience. I've been working there like um, just over two years now, actually. Oh, cool. and, and towards the end of this month, I'm, I'm going back down there to continue working there. But um, yeah, it's just it's, it's really like, it's just something I feel really passionate about. It's incredibly, it's incredibly uh, meaningful work that is like you can, you can see in real time this this amazing healing taking mm -hmm. place. You know, people who are arriving there with uh, sometimes multiple decades of um, just just anxiety, depression uh, built up into their system, and to see that release over the course of a week is is really really amazing to be a part of and and such a huge learning experience for me as well you know right. so so what, um, what was your role there mate what, what was it you were actually kind of doing on a, on a day-to-day -day basis so my job title is a psych is psychedelic facilitator and mm -hmm. so my 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 role is to work with guests through all phases of the retreat experience from from the beginning kind of the uh before the psilocybin sessions sort of preparing uh, building rapport uh, with 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 the guests, getting to know each other, um, sharing information about what the experience is like, what to expect, how to you know maybe approach um, navigating a psychedelic experience for anyone who's new to the experience, and then um, so yeah, I mean there are like these these three phases of of the work over the retreat week. There's the before, the during the sessions themselves, and then the afterwards and. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said about about each 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 step of the way, but um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and I think with it being, I think this is probably possibly one of the parts that gets missed within the whole kind of psychedelic community is that 
there, there is a, a, um, a kind of a holisticness to these things. Like if it's all very well good and going on, on a retreat and having, you know, this amazing experience, but if you don't have the kind of the support framework that's there with it, you know, if you don't feel, you know, like you're being looked after on the retreat or like you're not fully um, being given, you know, the tools to know what to expect, then it kind of, I think it falls apart quite quickly. So I think what's important with, with these retreats is that you do have somewhere where they give you this kind of full package. And it sounds like that's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, if that, that was part of, part of your role there. But kind that's of so what, true, yeah. What, 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 was it, what was it that drew you to, like, to a psilocybin retreat? Because although there's quite a few of them around, it's, it's certainly not, um, when you think of retreats, the, the one that always comes to mind is like ayahuasca retreats. These are, this is right. kind of, you know, the, the the mainstream you want at the moment so what, yeah. was it was it that you felt like particularly drawn to work with the mushroom or was it that you were sort of drawn to this particular organization or this location what was it that that pulled you there yeah well i mean let me say that first that i, I completely agree with what you've said and like my experience there has just really emphasized the importance of the context around the use of these substances you know it's as, at least as important as the substance itself to have um you know, experienced, uh, experienced professional, uh, compassionate support around mm -hmm. all phases of the experience makes so such a big difference. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was drawn to this uh, to this spe specific retreat center for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, t to be fair, I was kind of at a point in my life where any opportunity to work at a psychedelic retreat center, I would have I would have jumped at that uh, opportunity. This was. A little over two years ago um, but I mean Micah meditations in particular was really jumped out out at me just uh, due to uh, the the apparent level of, of experience and professionalism and just just the quality of the the, the service that was being offered there um, I could I could almost just sense that from a distance um, psilocybin had played a huge role in my life up to that point, you know, like my very first ever psychedelic experience almost 10 years ago was with psilocybin and, um, that was just like a, a, a huge, uh, and, and, and transformative experience for me, uh, in, in many different ways. I mean, I was, I was dealing with a lot of anxiety in my life at that time. I was in college and, uh, you know, just going through this whole process of trying to figure out like what am I doing with my life? Like, mm -hmm. what is my career? What is like, how do I make this something meaningful? And, and like, where, 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 which direction am, am I going in? And, uh, just putting a lot of pressure on myself around all of that and feeling a lot of anxiety. And in that mushroom experience, it all just sort of evaporated. Like it was all, it was all gone. And I remember f sensing what a, um, what a revelation it was just that utter simplicity of just being yeah. present absorbed in nature looking at the grass looking at the trees looking at the insects flying by just uh, it was it was almost like this sense of awe therapy you know mm -hmm. where like all of a sudden everything appeared so unbelievably beautiful and miraculous and mysterious that it just captivated my attention fully absorbed all everything and everything else just just melted away and um you know i wouldn't say that that was like an instant overnight cure for my anxiety but from that point on that was like a reference point for me you know that like yeah. i've had this experience i know it's possible there's another way to be there's another mm. way to live and i can revisit that even outside of the psilocybin experience you know and it was like a deeper it did also feel like a deeper sort of spiritual experience for me at the time you know i was i was an atheist i was a materialist um through and through and uh this like <laughs> essentially just took a sledgehammer and just put a big crack in that uh, just like deeply entrenched way of, of, of seeing the world because it was like this feeling of, of, of the sacredness of life. It's hard to know how else to express it, but just like the absolute mystery and miraculous nature of everything was so like overwhelmingly apparent mm -hmm. um, that – uh, you know, this this quality of life that it, it just everything is a miracle. The fact that my heart is beating right now is a miracle. You know, in even in the, these seemingly mundane or ordinary details of life, um, there is this miraculous quality that had just always passed me by, you know. 
I almost hadn't wasn't even aware of it in my in my everyday life prior to that. And um, that was like a sense of a deep sense of reconnecting to a bigger picture awareness that I think really played a huge um, a huge role in everything that. I wanted to explore from that point on. So that's sort of a long-winded answer uh, to your question, but yes. It's a beautiful answer, mate. And it, I think you've, you've, you've phrased that beautifully and I, I can so relate to it because I've just come back from a San Pedro weekend. Yes. Um, and I had pretty much exactly what you described. And I mean, I've had this, this kind of experience and that kind of realization a few times before. And, and like you mentioned, it's, and, and again, I think this is something which trips people up a little bit because it, it doesn't necessarily stay with you forever, um, mm. but mm. you get that fleeting moment and just that moment of purest simplicity is enough mm. just to remind you how full of shit you, you have been <laughs> and how, how much nonsense you've stacked on your own shoulders. You just see it for um. that fleeting moment. It's like, things can be really simple. Like, I, I did not need to make this so complicated. And... Just and just that moment will will do you for a good a good long time and yeah hopefully at some point I can get myself into some kind of you know perhaps permanent state like that where I just <laughs> yeah. re- can, can prevent all this crap from building up on my shoulders. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I I, I had a, mm. just a similar experience over the weekend. I was sat there, um, absolutely just just high as a kite on 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 San Pedro, and I was looking at the sky, and within the kind of the visions I was having, I just solved reality <laughs> and it, yeah. it, just, it yep. just clicked into place oh and that I was, was like, you yeah. oh yeah yeah no, yeah man, yeah you, you can thank me later for that one but it, it just clicked into place and i was like oh well if 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 this is this simple then surely i'm not any more complicated like if i can solve this and i'm you know watching clouds and the sun and it's just all nature you know, i've got my fingers in the dirt and like yeah then why why do I make myself so complicated? And just this moment of purest clarity and your soul just kind of resets and you're like, mm. oh, and yes. uh, yeah, and, it, and I think that that's, especially when, you know, you mentioned, you know, being at college and all the, the sort of, the anxieties you're feeling there. And certainly, you know, I've had a similar thing from being at work and the anxieties are there. And we've all, you know, the planet's experiencing it globally. We've all got this shit going on with, with COVID and the anxieties yes. come from there. And, you know, there's a million and one ways to or reasons to feel anxious and they're all very valid. Yeah. Um, but the, the way that we clutch onto that anxiety is so toxic for our own souls. Mm. And mm. yeah, I think that's that's like the, the sledgehammer that psychics do just just bark, just smashes that down, and you, and yeah, you can just sit there and think, wow, what, what I've I, I don't know, it sounds kind of derogatory stuff, but you can just think, wow, what a fucking dummy I've been. Like I've why did I not just have it was so obvious. It was <laughs> obvious how much I love my wife. It was obvious that I right. I've been treating myself like shit. It was obvious right. that I you know I could have changed my situation. And uh, yeah, man. I mean, it's 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 great that you had that, especially at such a. Um, you mentioned that you had it at quite a quite a young age then. Um, yeah. Because I think it was. Yeah, from, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go so go so go. Tell tell us a bit more. Was it like for, you've been sort of in this practice now for about like ten years, and since you came out of out of college. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that that's a, sounds like a really like meaningful and healing experience that you had over the weekend, right? And it is like. It had its moments. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it, it, ten, it tends, it, the psychedelic experience tends to have its moments in that sense. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it is, it is like there, it's funny how there is this like utter simplicity to true wisdom, you mm-hmm. know, of, of where um, we tend to get lost in the mind and just overcomplicate things so much. And it, it just becomes like a tangled mess, you know. But uh, I think I think this is the wisdom of 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 presence, right? Of 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 simply being, of not trying to constantly get somewhere, always yeah. in pursuit of some goal, of some you know better, brighter future. Um, yeah, I mean th- this 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 was really something that came out of that that uh, first experience uh, with with mushrooms for me was that like I realized uh, I'm always trying to 
get somewhere, you know, like I'm always trying to reach some goal of whatever it is, you know, career success or relationship or, uh, you know, you know, some deeper, more fuller sense of wholeness, contentment. Um, uh, but I was also experiencing in that this sort of mental reset where all of that was just switched off and I could intuitively sense how there was this radically different approach to finding peace and, and joy in my mm -hmm. life, which was going deeper inwards, going deeper into presence, coming out of this like compulsive thinking, always trying to like figure things out, solve all our problems and um, again, I was trying to if get just somewhere. If I'm just explore that a bit with you, because yeah, yeah. where, where do you think is, is the balance then? Because you know, you and I, we're doing something similar. We kind of we we both got these YouTube channels, and we've we probably get you know we've got our like psychedelic practice, our spiritual practice, and we're both kind of doing stuff around that to you know you could say to 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 give it a voice to spread the word or something like that. Mm. So we do have these kind of goals, but yes. then like you said, but then there is a, a, a kind of an, an internal need to shut that off and just kind of, you know, be focused on yourself and find that kind of stillness. But then somebody's got to fly the flag. This is a bit I struggle with a little bit. It, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, like I, you know, there's, there's a part in, in my head, which is like, well, you know, be the project guy, be the guy who, you know, builds the center or be the guy who who makes it be the guy who gets the word out there but then if you do that you can get lost in that guy and yeah and then sort of you know sometimes I, i've i've sat there and have it had a like psychic experience and thinking am i doing this to make a youtube video about it or am i doing uh, this for me <laughs> like uh, it's uh, and, yeah. and you know and it's 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 sometimes it's very hard to separate out those entities and and, and i think both are, are good you know good goals as long as you don't get carried away and become like you know an egotistical maniac who just wants to right. make money out of it or or become you know someone who just completely neglects you know say all the commitments and just disappears off you know staring right. at a wall or something there's, there's a balance somewhere but how, how do you approach that that balance that that is such an excellent question very well stated and also you know there's it's very self-aware of you to observe that uh, within yourself because this is something that i've you know, spent a lot of time exploring within my own life. And yeah, there is this like, so on one hand, you have all of these, you know, wisdom teachings, all these spiritual teachings talking about presence, about how, uh, you know, true peace is within, how going more deeply into inner stillness, inner silence is the ultimate source of peace, love, joy, contentment, all these things. You have that on one hand, but then on the other hand, even for someone who has uh, who has absorbed those teachings, they're not just going to sit on their couch for the rest of their life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I could just sit here like in, in a deep state of meditation for the rest of my life, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, and even in some, in some senses, like being a human being requires activity. It requires action. Connection, Otherwise we yeah. die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like we literally will die if, I, if we don't go to the store and get food and feed ourselves, <laughs> you know, like not to mention connection and all these other aspects of being a human that bring value to ourselves and allow us to uh, bring value to others. There's this balance between being and doing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Eckhart Tolle um, speaks about this, this, this inner purpose and this outer purpose, this inner movement and this outer movement, right? And like one funny example that he gives is like, you know, if you're a realized being and you're driving along and you get a flat tire, you're not just going to sit there, uh, you know, in a deep state of meditation and peace. There's a natural action to be done there. You go and you change the tire, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very simple, that's a very simple example, I guess. But um, there is a way to combine being and doing to the point where they're not these two separate things, right? Like what I, one example of this is flow states like um, athletes, musicians, creatives report these experiences. And I think we all, we all experience these states in, in some cases of, of being in the zone, right? Where everything else fades away. We're absolutely absorbed in uh, the present moment, in the activity of hand, at, at hand. We're not thinking about you know, what we're going to have for dinner or whatever, anything else, right? Just absolute effortless absorption, which is both peak performance and peak enjoyment of the the process itself 
yeah. right? And in that moment, like, uh, there's no separation between being and doing. We're absolutely absorbed in the doing this. It's, it's, there are these flow states, right? And so, you know, I think that's one, that's one way of understanding uh, the, the potential of integrating both being and doing into this sort of like seamless thing. And um, one person who, I've, spo- who I've, I've spoken with sort of compared this to a pendulum, you know, how like at some phases of our life, the pendulum is going to swing more to this extreme mm-hmm. and other phases of our life, it's going to swing more to this extreme. Eventually, maybe it will settle down more in the middle in a, in a balanced way, you know, and um, this is a great challenge, right? This is a great challenge. For sure. This is, I, I, I see this as the combination of spiritual awakening and, and self-actualization, like reaching our fullest potential, you know, like blossoming to the fullest, being the fullest expression of this life that we are. And ultimately, I mean, these are not two separate things like spiritual awakening and self-realization. I think there is just, um, there's a deeper unity to all this, right? But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is something that I, I was, I've have in the past struggled tremendously with because at the time that I, you know, first had some of these psychedelic experiences and was sort of having this awakening, uh, like I said, I was in, I was in college and all this whole while trying to figure out like, you know, like what is my career? What is my life meaning? What is my life purpose? Uh, these are really big life. These are really big existential questions, yep. you know. And on one hand, like all the spiritual wisdom was pointing me towards stillness, towards going within. And on another hand, like I was, I was feeling the need, the compulsion to like go out and create things. Um, <clears throat> I think the final point here for me is that the with this inner purpose and outer purpose, the inner purpose is primary, right? Like going within and doing this inner work, healing. Uh, becoming more self-aware, this sort of shadow work, uh, confronting these unconscious dynamics in our life, gaining a uh, greater and greater self-awareness, and ultimately, you know, seeing beyond the ego, these 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 aspects of of spiritual awakening. This is the foundation mm. of 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 finding peace, wellness, joy. Yep. Ultimately, it, it 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 does come from within. The more solid that that foundation is of of consciousness of self-awareness then i think the more effortlessly this sort of outer purpose begins to flow and there is this intuitive this inner intuitive guidance system in a way that i think is tied to our emotionality right so like you know you hear people say follow your bliss follow your excitement follow your passion it's kind of a cliche spiritual idea but um in some senses, I do think that's that's the compass needle pointing to true north. You know, like uh, the more that we cultivate uh, self awareness, healing, and this sort of this sort of inner purpose, then the more that we're sensitive to what our true our true passion is, our true excitement, our true desires, yeah. rather than like our these egoic ideas of like all these voices in our head about what we should or shouldn't be doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think, and I think that's a, a part of it. Is, is the when when you do do the the follow your blessing, I think you've got to make sure it's your bliss that you're following because it's very easy, I think, to import uh, a a mythology or a set of ideas. You know that this is you know, oh, I'm I'm spiritual now, so I will import the spiritual ideas of whatever my spiritual thing is, and then you kind of you know you can very easily find yourself you know in the jungle somewhere or something, and then you you know. You realize actually yeah this is not for me at all so mm-hmm. i think it's as long you've really got to find that that this is your thing you know not everybody is meant to be a shaman or a facilitator or a, you know a caregiver right. or a healer or a or a painter or you know or anything we're not all into so you, i think it's yeah find the thing that's kind of true for for you and resonates with you and uh and yeah that, that in itself is is not a not an easy thing to talk at all no. and I'm kind of, I think I'm probably having the reverse experience that what you dis- described because I've, what I've, at the moment, I've got two kids who are, so that's kind of my life at the moment. I, mm. And I can hide behind that shield of, oh, I've, <laughs> I've got two kids, my life's sorted for the next few years. But they're kind of coming of age now. And in like sort of four uh. or five years' time, 
they're going to be possibly, you know, leaving home, going to university and stuff. Right. So in like five years time, I've got to suss out who I am without that. Sort of like without, it's like, who am I going to be in five years? To, like, like uh-huh. who, what am I going to do? Like once, you know, because I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not going to be a teenager anymore. I'm not going to be in my 20s anymore. I'm not going to be young and dumb and stupid anymore. I've got all this shit that I've picked up, all this awakening stuff I've picked up over the last, you know, couple of yeah. years. And now suddenly I'll be like, oh, it's just me in this empty house now. Right, what the fuck's <laughs> going on here? So, I, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm expecting some kind of midlife crisis, like, coming down the line. Um, so that'll be it. That'll be interesting. So was all was all that Rob was all that coming up like during your the, this this uh, San Pedro retreat that you recently had? You were kind of examining it, these things or what? It didn't come up in that particular retreat. Some other stuff did, but it's certainly come up in previous ones because um, it's it's kind of it, it ties into this. You know when you so I'm I'm like forty. Got to forget now. Forty four now. So, you know, I mean, sure, very, very much. Sure. Oh, oh, yeah, mate, yeah. It's very, I've got very good moisturizer. Um, so, but, so you, you get to this point of life where it's like, okay, the next phase of my life is kind of, you know, you know possibly, you know, like re- retirement or something. That, that's the next bit after, after the kids are done, you know, that. So then, you know, when you, as you get older, you start making these kind of plans in your head. You think, oh, when I'm, when I'm this age, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to move to a different country. I'm going to, I'll make a, you know, you, you come up with all these things that you put on the back burner and you can do that because you're very young and mm. at some point you're going to have to deal with it. And then again, you know, at some point maybe kids come along. So that kind of puts a wall around it for like a good, you know, 18, 20 years. And so you mm. don't have to think about it anymore. And now that's going away and it's like, okay, I said I was going to go and do all this stuff. Am I actually going to go and do it now? Is that who I am now? Am I I'm a little, not quite as invincible as I was when I was in my late 20s? So, yeah, it's just some stuff to work out. But the stuff that did come up in the San Pedro retreat um, were... And it's it's something that's... It, it's come up a few times, but, it, but the San Pedro verbalized it very nicely for me, was that I just... Um, I felt um, incredibly, well, I mean, first of all, I went through like waves of complete euphoria and just like, it was just mm. amazing. But I also went through waves of feeling completely disconnected from just everyone around me who seemed to be having a, a, a much better time. And I wasn't going under, I wasn't having a bad time, but there were people all like sort of crying tears of joy and hugging each other. And I was like, I don't know what to do with myself here. I'm really just, I was just, I could feel myself like retreating inwards Mm. in a way that I do. I'm very, you know, quite introverted sometimes. Mm. And it just became painfully obvious to me. Like I've got to deal with this problem. Like I spend so much time prattling on about connection and wanting to be connected. And I do, it's genuine. It's absolutely genuine Mm. that I Mm. want to, you know, build bridges like, you know, like we're doing now or or to, you know, to anyone, I, I want this. But when it comes to the crunch, I just like <laughs> just 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 retreat. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, no mm. pun intended. Retreat, but uh, I just into myself, and I'm just, <laughs> um, yeah, feel very. Uh, it, it 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 really hit me in the face on, on this on the last night. This some mm. pepper I felt very uh, lonely. To be honest, it was mm. Um, mm. I had this this wave of like sadness and loneliness, which I felt a few times. And yeah, I've got my own suspicions on why that is um but it's a very it's a very strange experience sort of mescaline it's um it's not as i wouldn't say it's as openly visual as say mushrooms or Ah. or ayahuasca or something like that it kind of makes everything like an oil painting it's very or pastels or something like that Ah. but what it does um emotionally is yeah it's it's like a kind of a bit of an emotional bulldozer. Um, mm. It's um, like, yeah, people were just absolutely weeping and wailing and sobbing and just laughing and stuff. It's, uh, and it lasts a long time and, uh-huh. and, it, comes, and yeah. it comes on extremely slow. Um, so yeah, you're mm. talking a good, probably two hours from when you drink it to when you first feel it. And then probably about another two hours until it kind of peaks. Uh-huh. Um, and it tastes vile. Absolutely, absolutely vile. It's like yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, hey, I mean, like it, it that that does sound challenging in some senses, but that also sounds like a, an important experience to have, right? Because for sure. this is how we increase our self awareness, how we um, work through these issues that can, uh, you know, in normal waking consciousness, we can kind of just sweep under the rug and push it down and pretend like nothing's there and that we're all good. But yeah. Um, I do think that this is like the way that we evolve, you know, and the way that we mature and, and sort of like that that process of self-actualization, right? Healing is a huge part of that and and uh, emotional awareness, emotional intelligence is is like right at the at the core of all that. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like just I, I think what what matures us, what takes us along the path is experience. You know, you if you you know, you, you experience some things as a child and you get exposed to more stuff. And, you know, clearly you see people mature along their lifetimes where hopefully you get to a point, you know, in your later life where you've kind of, you've made your peace with the world and made your peace with yourself and your peace with the family and, you, and, you know, and you're ready for the sort of kind of like the final sort of transition there. And I think that's what, that's really what I get from, from psychedelics is it's like how much, how much experience do you want? You can have all the experience in the world in this in this right. sort of hyper, um, yeah, session of it, and it just it, it's kind of it, it's mind blowing. You know, it, it's like, it would be like sort of if you stuck together scuba diving, skydiving, flying on a spaceship. Um, you know, all, just all these the most extreme things, standing at the top of Mount Everest, all the most extreme forms of human experience just glued together within a kind of like, you know, six to 10 hours experience. And, you know, there you go. Right. Those experiences will change it. It will change you standing at the top of Mount Everest and looking out like, wow, this is, this is, you know, this is our planet. It would change you being, you know, you know when you, you know, scuba diving down to like, you know, the bottom of the, the ocean, you see all these crazy life forms. It's like, wow, this is, the world is so much bigger than what I thought it was. And right. yeah, and it certainly changes you when you see, triple transforming singing geometry in, in DMT space. I'll, I'll, I'll do something for you as well. <laughs> uh, I noticed that a couple, a couple of questions popping up in the feed here. Uh, so just first I'll say hello to, yeah, hey to everyone who's, who's here. Trent, Fish, uh, Sam, Rory, Mountain, Mike, Force. Good to see you all. Um, so Mike asks, what do you guys do for integrating the experiences? The journeys give us the wisdom teachings, but it's certainly just as much, if not more, about integration. Hard work for sure. So I guess I'll, I'll, do you want to take a stab at that one, Jonas? Because I think that sounds like your bread and butter. Sure, yeah. Um, well, you know, like the content of the psychedelic experience is so broad and varied like there's you know there can be so many different there's so many different types of psychedelic experiences but when it comes to integration the f the fa the fundamentals of integration are pretty much always the same and really you know i think the most important piece is giving ourselves time and space mm. in in stillness essentially in silence in meditation to just let the experience continue to wash over us to continue to feel inwardly uh, at whatever emotional content is coming up, you know, after the effects have worn off, whatever insights are coming up, just 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 feeling inwardly, observing inwardly in a sort of non-judgmental way, almost in a meditative state, and just allowing it to really steep in us, like sink in into us, you know. And there's a lot that can be sort of layered on top of that and added to it. I think journaling is a really, really good method of putting our thoughts down, of of, you know, sort of sorting through this chaotic whirlwind of like all this stuff that's been going on and just, you know, when we put it down into words, we have something concrete there, you know, and mm -hmm. that can help us sort of organize, remember our thoughts, our insights, um, any sort of emotional breakthroughs, any mystical experiences, uh, any sort of creative outlet uh, is a great way of, of integrating, of expressing, you know, of some people like to, to make paintings or, or make some music or sing or dance or whatever feels right this can help us continue to process the experience um and and to express the experience in this in that sense it's it's becoming integrated it's becoming a part of who and what we are mm. another huge and absolutely essential part is um finding others who are you know finding an empathetic compassionate trustworthy listener uh or or someone you know 
doesn't have to be someone who's a psychedelic expert or anything like that. Just a good friend, you know, or or a family member, or a loved one who you can uh, who you really trust and who you can talk about this experience with. It for me, I mean, it's just it's just always helpful to communicate, to uh, put it into words, to um, as a means of processing and also as a means of getting reflection back, right? A lot of times um, people will have a different perspective on an experience that we have that can help us, that can help, uh, help us gain new insights into that experience. Um, so yeah, talking about it um, with, and, and, and connecting, like you said, connecting with others who can kind of share or empathize with that experience to some extent uh, is, is, is really important. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I would pretty much mirror everything you've said there. And I mean, I think in particular, for, for me, the, the, the talking about it and the journaling, it kind of, it goes hand in hand, which I actually think this channel is, is pretty much my efforts to, um, mm. to, to, to journal and to, to talk about it. And yeah, a lot yeah. of the times when I, when I make a video, particularly if, I, if I'm something in the aftermath of a psychedelic experience, I'm surprised at what comes out of my mouth because I'm just spewing it out and i'm like oh right yeah that is how i felt about it that is uh, and so just you've got to give yourself that opportunity just to yeah to to verbalize it to to write it down and i think one thing i used to get really hung up on was um, in particular when it came to written journals was just them being crap and and i kind of had to get over like yeah my my journals are I just shit. My handwriting's a terrible. <laughs> it doesn't come out as like beautiful poetry. When I try and draw something, uh, my my writing's just. I mean, my drawing is just terrible. But it's it's fine, and it's right. not there necessarily for anyone else to see. It's not yeah. there. And I I, just, I remember one time I was on uh, I, was, I was in Peru and I was, you know, I was going to my place in the Maloca and there was this super talented girl there and she was she was drawing in her journal just the most amazing beautiful you know representations and like my heart just broke because i knew that my journal just sucked <laughs> in comparison <laughs> and i felt like almost ashamed of it but yeah you, you just get over it you just um yeah, yeah. It, it's it's that's not the point the point is just to um you know make make the unconscious conscious give yourself an, an outlook to do it so yeah, yeah i would mirror absolutely everything john has just said and just sort of do it without kind of Without judgment of yourself. Um, yes. And I, I think an, another bit that's a little bit tricky there is um, thinking you are doing it wrong, um, mm. which, again, was something I... It's very typical as well with, with meditation. Um, like, you, you kind of sit there, it's like, am I doing this wrong? Nothing's happening. And I think you, you can do the same with integration as well. We sit there like, sure. like, how do I integrate? I must must think really hard about this experience so that i yeah. get it right yeah, yeah. It's, kind of, it's kind of like no dude just just let it just, like i said just just let it arise naturally and there's, yes. it's not it's not a rubik's cube to be solved it's right. it's kind of something just to sort of live through so yeah exactly. I, I, th- I think that that would be how i'd, I'd sort of best go for inter- integration just find, make that space for yourself mm. and maybe anchor that that space with some kind of practice so like meditation uh, rapé is also, you know, something I used to, as a as a way to open that space. I'll just, which is kind of like Brazilian, not Brazilian, just like Amazon yeah, yeah. snuff, um, or just you know, smoke a uh, like a Apache cigar or light some incense or whatever. Just just something to signify that you're making that space, and then um, and then yeah, just, like I said, to just make that a sort of a regular thing for yourself. So I, I right. hope that an- answers your question, Mike. Uh, there's another question here from. I guess this is more one for me from well, it's from two guys from Force Major and for Cool Craps. Uh, comparison of San Pedro to Peyote, and also have you done Peyote? Is San Pedro the same? So technically, um, San Pedro and Peyote are both mescaline, so they should be the same. I've never done Peyote, although I grow Peyote. Um, because they're so difficult to grow and they take so long to grow, I've got no intention of eating them at all. They, these are like my <laughs> little babies. But San yeah. Pedro, yeah, I've just done a, I've done a, a few times. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it, it's a similar experience. But then, you know, with a lot of these, when you're consuming these plants, people will do say there are subtle differences between them. So I wouldn't want to be so bold as to say, yes, they're exactly the same. Um, but from a 
chemical level, it's the same active ingredient. Well, I, let, let me just say, uh, I, I, I have not tried either, but from what I've heard, peyote has like many, many different alkaloids in it mm. that are not present in San Pedro. And we know very little about that, but you know, sub- supposedly it does lead to a potentially slightly different experience. But again, I haven't tried either. So, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give it another like five years. I might be able to come back and, and tell you after my uh, <laughs> after my pills. They're like they're like this big. I've, I've been growing them about like four years now, and they're still like the size of like a, <laughs> yeah. a, a, a sweetie. You know, a little piece of candy. So, yeah, um, we'll we'll see. But San Pedro, you, it's it's quite grows quite quickly and grows quite large and but it's got a lot less uh, mescaline content in it so as a result you have to drink a lot more of it and so i was drinking over the weekend on each day um probably three glasses about well actually i think on the first day i drank four so four glasses around this big which were full of kind of like cactus oatmeal um it was Yum. yeah this is this green crunchy <laughs> slime um, yeah, it's 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 not it, it's not a good. I'd, I'd still it's not as bitter as something like ayahuasca, but ayahuasca you only have to drink like a tiny little amount, so that's 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 one thing. This you have to just keep on glugging, and your guts are just full of it. So yeah, but it's it's worth it. Trust me, it's worth it. Um, Delicious. El Rogue asks, have either of you guys experienced a darkness in the DMT space, and if so, what are your thoughts on what it is or why it appears? So I think you've done your first share of, of DMT, mate. What, what do you think? Have you ever have you had? Have, has it always been positive experiences, or have you ever had seen something sinister in there? Oh, uh, whew. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, in referencing the darkness, I'm not sure if if uh, there's like a particular experience that you're referring to. But if you just mean like darkness or like a sinister thing in general, oh yeah, 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 absolutely. I've experienced that. Um, I think it is relatively uncommon. I do think that, uh, you know, the majority of, of DMT experiences, they can feel like incredibly intense and even, mm. you know, overwhelming in a sense, but not necessarily dark. Um, according, according to the research of like, like Rick Strassman and like a few others who have studied this experience, they seem to be mostly positive, but for sure there can be some unbelievably terrifying, um, experiences, uh, even, even hellish in nature. I'll say the most, the, the, the most, uh, this, the most frightening experience that I ever had, it was only, it was only one experience out of, out of several dozen of these experiences. Uh, the subjective experience that I had was that it felt like I was observing uh, Earth, planet Earth, from essentially like a cosmic perspective. Mm-hmm. And um, there were these beings. Uh, I'm not presenting this as like the, the actual fact of the situation. I'm just saying what the experience was. There, <laughs> there were these beings like these extra dimensional uh, uh, Earth overlords is the only way I can put it, who were essentially what they seemed to be doing was manipulating the uh, human experiment of, of uh, human life on Earth. And uh, in a sinister way, in a, in a way, it was, it was presented, it was like experienced in a sense that it was like, this is the reality of the situation. You have no control over it. You're mm-hmm. essentially like a little cell in a Petri dish and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, it, I think the real, the real, like, it was just very ominous, you know? Like, yeah. um, I think the, the ideas of, of good versus evil, um, you know, look very different from a cosmic perspective than from a human perspective, um, from, like, a limited human understanding but uh, that was the only time I, I, I encountered an experience that felt like, like really dark. But yeah, that was that was that was that was pretty ominous. That was pretty scary. What what about you, Rob? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, just just to comment on what, what you described, I think, I think that when you say, describe it as ominous, I think that is the thing that we as humans, it's it's we always want to put things into sort of goodies and baddies, and you know, right. good versus evil, and that's that's very easy for us to get our head around. But when you just come across something that is indifferent, that like you know, it's like you say, we, we are the, we are the swab on the on the petri dish, and it's you know, it it it's either you know, 
with some kind of something to be experimented on or even just something that's like just completely unaware of that's i think even more terrifying i think so i can really re- relate to what, what you said there but for me it was the, i know and this is out of all my dmt experiences i've only had one where i would class as um startling in its it kind of yep. made me pay attention and it was where it it was going into the full experience and i was like okay here we go it looked like it was all you know hyperspace and chrysanthemums and all that and then it just stopped and broke and went to like a sort of ms dos um you know system has failed type screen Mm, mm. and it just and this voice just clear as a bell in my head it just just went and this is what it looks like when it goes wrong oh and it just stopped and i was like this like what happens now and i was was like is is this you know you're in this timeless moment and it was just a void and it was clearly broken it wasn't doing what i thought it was gonna do and i I just thought i was stuck there forever and then it just kind of rebooted and went back into the experience but that moment shook me to my core i was Mm. i was like Mm. you know how close was i there to like annihilation of 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 me um so yeah there, there's there's I, I think it was it was just the at, at the time you know, i think it was when i first got into dmt and i was probably doing it like sort of two or three times a week and it gave me a, a bit of a slap to sort of like a hey, chill out dude you know yeah yeah, yeah. Ba- back to the integration topic like maybe makes take some time with it with this thing you know you don't need to do it all at once um so yeah in a way i'm kind of uh i'm kind of grateful for that um yep DMT telling me, telling me to pace, pace a bit, but I've certainly had plenty of dark experiences on, on ayahuasca, but I would say that's pretty much what you expect on ayahuasca. Mm. Um, I, mm. I, if, if I go on an ayahuasca retreat and I get one good night, I'm happy with that because, yeah, I, I firmly go expecting like a, a week of nightmares and, yeah, I usually get that. So, so, so it's... Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a, a bit of a, a double edged sword, but I'd say for vape DMT, um, yeah. As as for as for what what it is or why it appears, I, I would just say it's it it's probably something to do with the balance of our, our ego versus the, the just the vastness of what is being experienced, and I think you can get mm. a bit cavalier with that, which is you know like I was talking about sort of doing doing it a few times a week. Because it, it is, I, I, I would, would still stand that. I think DMT, NNDMT is the most extraordinary experience I think that is available to a human being ever. It, it's, you know, I mean, you could use all these different words of it's insane, it's bizarre, but I mean, it's, it's stunningly beautiful and mm. it's absolutely humbling. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's something necessary to be understood or to be to put into a box and right. and to say it's this or that. it's it, it's something to almost like prostrate you know pr- right, I always get so is it prostate or prostrate prostrate well, I know one's one's a thing up your bum and the other one yeah like it's not prostate do. so it's like <laughs> prostrate right. so yes you should prostrate yourself before it and like you know like being be in awe of it it's it's yeah it's a wondrous experience so I think it's when you forget that that's when it gives you the t- bit of a bit of a slap and teaches you a lesson very well said very well said i I completely agree i mean the the entire experience in general i mean there's this impulse to ask like why or to try to understand it but like at the end of the day if we're being honest it's an infinite mystery Mm -hmm. and like the human mind cannot grasp it cannot like encapsulate the infinite you know like uh there's something very mysterious going on here and and um yeah it's it's it it demands exploration but it's also very paradoxical you know it's like it's potentially many different things at at once i think like the idea of encountering something that is nothing and yet everything Mm -hmm. uh you know like from a human perspective that makes absolutely no sense it makes no sense whatsoever um and yet you know it's something that can be experienced in dmt so we have to like when trying to conceptually understand and analyze we have to hold our that those those concepts those insights very lightly because um there's something much greater much bigger uh going on here i believe yeah i think that's actually probably a really good 
good point there that we can segue into the other topic which we wanted to talk about, which is around these ancient civilizations, which whereby, you know, there seems to be something baked into the culture which is just in reverence to these psychedelic substances. So, I mean, the obvious ones here are like the, you know, civilizations in, in Peru, like, you know, um, the uh, Inca civilizations around like, you know, Machu Picchu or, you know, up in Mexico, like this, sort of the Aztec civilizations. So these, these different cultures very much based around, it seems, these, um, you know, some kind of psychedelic ceremony. And yet, and then what's resulted is these basically, you know, what just incredible um, projects um, which seem to be built with the, with the purpose of showing some kind of reverence to something greater than them. Mm. You know, so, you know, again, all these temples in, in Peru, I know you, one of your videos I watched recently on, on, uh, on, on the Nazca lines, which is mm. just, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. I know there's all this recent stuff around... Um, you know things like the the Greek temples, and that there's some kind of some kind of psychedelic uh, beverage was used right. within the, within the t- Greek temples in what was called the uh, the Greater Mysteries, which is just like the best name ever for a psychedelic ceremony. Um, <laughs> so, and I know you've been doing like a series on this, and I've this is something I've been interested in for a long time because it's it for a a culture to invest that much time and resources into building these kind of monuments, it's Whereas, you know, you could be doing anything. You could be farming, you could be feeding, you know, feeding your people. You could be, you know, building an army to sort of take over other territory. To build one of these monuments, like something like a, you know, a pyramid or, a, you know, a Machu Picchu, this is a tremendous undertaking. And mm. and I think that the only way that these things, that, that kind of explains these things is that if you are doing it because you are basically trying to recreate something that you have seen within what seems like a divine vision so just wondering what, like with, with all the uh, the stuff that you've been looking at recently what what's your take on, on what's going on here on all these different sites well it's an incredible mystery i i think in in a, in a lot of senses like uh well first of all i mean you're you're absolutely right that like it's important to acknowledge that all over the world for thousands of years, our ancestors have been using uh, psychoactive substances in, mm. in their uh, shamanic, spiritual, religious traditions. Um, you know, you have ayahuasca in the Amazon, all throughout Central America, but it's, it's really global. It's really global. You have in India this mysterious soma, the ancient mm. Egyptians took psychedelic mushrooms and blue lily. Even in Siberia, they were taking... Uh, Amanita muscari, mm-hmm. you know, like this is a global thing and for, for, for thousands of years, for thousands of years. Um, and it is interesting to think about how the presence of these substances, because we know like, you know, we've experienced as, as members of the psychedelic community, how transformative uh, these things can be, these experiences can be, how they can serve as an evolutionary catalyst, right? So like, this is one of the things I, I'm, I'm interested in is like, how might thousands of years of psychedelic use all over the world have affected or influenced in subtle and maybe not so subtle ways the evolution of humanity as a species, as a collective, right? And you have things even like Terence McKenna, you know, the, the, the famous stoned ape yeah. theory from Terence McKenna, how uh, there is this great mystery in human evolution, like supposedly anatomically modern humans appeared on Earth first around 200,000 years ago, right? And... There was this mysterious point where the, the, the size of our brain, our, our prefrontal cortex, like dramatically expanded within a very, very short period of time. And people aren't really sure how to explain that, you know. Um, so this is what Terrence McKenna suggested. He said that, you know, like our, our distant ancestors over 100,000 years ago were for, foraging, found these psychedelic mushrooms, ate them, and that played a role. That was an evolutionary catalyst in their uh, – mental capacities and uh i don't know it's just really interesting to frame the the conversation around or, or, in, in that way because like this is really like a birthright of being of being a human being like this is part of our you know ancestral inheritance for mm-hmm. thousands of years like now going towards the uh i i, I think what it's interesting because growing up i was never all that interested in history like like cultures and stuff it kind of it kind of interested me but really what i was interested in was the mystery the mysteries 
like as a as a young kid, I was reading about like as much as I could, like UFOs, you know, like poltergeist activity, the Loch Ness monster, like <laughs> all the things where seriously, like all these all these topics where it was like it was on the fringes. There are there is some evidence. Like sometimes it's completely garbage. Sometimes there's like something really mysterious that's going on here. Um, what really has caught my attention about uh, some of these ancient sites, and there are certain hotspots around the world. Uh, Peru is one of them. Um, ancient Egypt is another one. India is another one. Where there are all these these ancient constructions that uh, are very difficult to explain for for a number of reasons. In in terms of their scale, in terms of their precision in terms of the fact that they were astronomically aligned to the stars um, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of years ago, these precise astronomical alignments. Rob, did you know that the Great Pyramid of Giza is the most accurately aligned structure that's ever been built by humans? Uh, it points... I, I think, I, think it, I read that in one of Graham Hancock's books, yeah. It's crazy. It, point, it points to true north to like less than one fifteenth of one degree. Mm -hmm. They align this thing to the stars, this massive... Uh, you know, like thirteen acre. It's huge. Um, you know, it's one thing to like look at the stars and to plot it out, but then to actually execute that uh, represents a very, very advanced um, level of of well, uh, a great importance. And this is the question that you're saying: like they could be doing anything with their mm -hmm. time, but for some reason, it's extremely important for them to. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to express this. I mean, this is part of the mystery, but to yeah. align themselves with the natural forces, right? To like tune themselves to the earth and the natural forces for whatever reason. Another well, think, interesting part. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say. I, I think it's it's that desire to, to to recreate heaven on earth. I mean, that's especially with, with the sort of the Giza plateau, where the way it's laid out within this that, that matches the constellation above it. It it is you know you know what is above shall be below you know it's you're, you're trying to right. it's it's almost like you're trying to literally make a like a portal you know you're making Earth a paradise by matching what what's in in the sky yeah. and um, and yeah and it, I mean it, it is the amount of belief you've got to have in that because I mean, it would be you know infinitely easier to say go and mine the mountains and bring me all the gold or go and raid the villages and bring me all the women or whatever. You, you, you know, there's so many more things which would appeal to like the conqueror or the dictator or the, or the greed. Mm. But, but no, they said mine all the rock and build this impossibly massive structure aligned mm. in this incredibly spe specific way. You know, and, and it's, again, it's not just one pyramid that's aligned this way. It's the entire sort of Giza plateau is, is, is aligned this way. So it clearly meant... A lot to them, and yeah, it 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 boggles the mind as to what puts that idea in someone's head to the degree that you would um, want to execute on it, knowing full well that you, right. you are talking about possibly a multi generational project here. Um, yep. So, and I, I this is where I think why why this, the psychedelic uh, theory is so compelling because you can have um, that vision that taste of the transcendent right. of of the divine it, it there is something that will put that right into your head and what what kind of startled me with it was that when i did um so particularly when i was when i was first doing dmt this kind of this imagery of this ancient architecture just came flooding mm. out of mm. it i was just mm. hit with waves of mayan step pyramids and yep. you know sort of like you know typical egyptian pyramids and you know sort of the greek pillars and it just it, it was just flooding out and on i i could not believe it and at that point i was similar to the, the person you described earlier was saying i was very cynical i was very skeptical i was very i was a diehard atheist and suddenly all this stuff is just pouring out of the ceiling and i'm like what the <laughs> fucking hell is going on um, yeah. And so I can only imagine yeah. that, that these guys had a similar experience, and that was like, "Shit, this is a sign from the gods. They want us to build this. They, th this yeah. will bring, this will elevate us." Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there, there, there are just so many mysteries that are like 
uh, you know, layered into this this study of some of these enigmatic uh, ancient ancient sites. Like a really interesting discovery that happened recently was the discovery of this place called Gobekli uh, Gobekli yeah, Tepe in, yeah. in, in 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 Turkey, uh, which was recently dated to twelve thousand years of age, right? And uh, that is a revolutionary discovery because as far as we know, like, like our conventional understanding of history is that like the first civilization, ancient, ancient Sumeria, which occurred in, in Mesopotamia, was around 6,000 years, years old. That was supposedly the first civilization. The, uh, we are closer to the ancient Sumerians than the ancient Sumerians were to Gobekli Tepe. Mm-hmm. That's, how old, that's how old this thing is. It's twice as old as Stonehenge and more than 50 times larger. The vast majority of it is still underground, right? It's been dated to 12,000 years old. Supposedly at that time, all all, all, the only humans on planet Earth were uh, primitive hunter-gatherer types, right? Like 6,000 years before the first civilization, people supposedly didn't have any sort of organized like societal structure, all these things, and yet they were moving these massive stone blocks some of some of which weighed in excess of ten tons, right? And not only that, but aligning them astro- astronomically to the stars, which which like essentially encoding mm-hmm. advanced knowledge of uh, astronomical knowledge uh, of of like the solstice and the equinox and all these things into this stone structure. Truly remarkable. There's another place uh, in Indonesia that's called Gunung Padang Pyramid. Yeah, and this is like a massive uh, pyramid. In Indonesia, that was the the core of it. It's like layered, right? The deepest core of it has been dated, and this is kind of controversial, but to around twenty thousand years ago. Twenty thousand years ago. So, like, all of our understanding of human history right now is because of these, mainly because of these two discoveries, is is being thrown into question. Mm-hmm. Now, another pe- another piece of evidence to throw into the mix is what's called the Sphinx weathering hypothesis. I made a video about this recently but there's this famous uh geologist called dr robert shock yep. out of uh boston university i believe who was invited by another egyptologist called john anthony west john anthony west went to the sphinx he saw on what's called the sphinx enclosure these signs of water erosion right but he wasn't an expert so he called in uh robert shock robert shock arrived he said absolutely like this is textbook water erosion right here now the problem with that is that the the it <laughs> The Sphinx is in the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. It hasn't rained there for many, many thousands of years. So the fact that there's water erosion on this Sphinx enclosure seems to suggest that the Sphinx must be many, many thousands of years earlier than previously estimated. Interestingly enough, Shock first estimated that it must be at least 12,000 years old, which dates to the same uh, time period as Gobekli Tepe, Mm -hmm. right? So, and that's like, when Egypt, Egypt was a this, much more sort of fertile place where it was sort of had like a lot, lot more vegetation, and so it had a, a sort of a rainier climate, I believe, at that point. Right. But the, the, the mysterious part about it is that the dynastic Egyptians hadn't arrived until many thousands of years later. Mm-hmm. So, the dynastic, what that suggests, what the Sphinx watering hypothesis suggests, and this too is controversial, but like hundreds of geologists have, you know, now agreed that like this is clear evidence unexplained evidence of, of water erosion in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Um, uh, what that suggests is that the Sphinx predates the dynastic Egyptians, mm-hmm. that they essentially inherited this site from an older uh, lost lost civilization, if you want to call it that. And we do see something similar in uh, Peru and South America. Um, I recently interviewed on, on my channel a guy called Brian Forrester who mm-hmm. lives in Peru. Goes, he goes to all these ancient sites and just documents evidence of what he calls uh, lost ancient, uh, ancient high technology, essentially. Mm-hmm. And um, again, I mean, this is kind of a proud idea. I, I mean, it's, it's on the fringes if you ask any sort of modern, uh, contemporary archaeologist. However, there is a lot of really, really compelling evidence that we're missing huge chapters from our understanding of history. And, um, yeah, I mean, for example, at, at Machu Picchu, um, I've never been there personally. I hope to, I hope to go there someday soon, but there are essentially these, uh, the Incas definitely lived at Machu Picchu. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of construction there, but, uh, what Brian Forster points out is that there's this megalithic core 
see is uh, some of the structures have essentially two layers stonework, where on the bottom layer, it's what's called polygonal masonry. It's all these, these large stone blocks that have been shaped in all these weird, irregular shapes fit together with unbelievable precision where you can't mm -hmm. stick like a razor blade between it. There's no mortar or anything used. Then, weirdly enough, you see on top of that, the ink, like these smaller stone blocks that are um, sort of uh, glued together with mortar. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, is, this is a great mystery, right? Like modern archeologists attribute both of the construction to the Incan. Yet, if the more advanced, like the, the, the better stonework is on the bottom, then that would suggest like essentially like a regression of their technological ability, yeah. right? Which makes no sense. It's like, if the, why would the more advanced parts of this structure be on the bottom and like the, the, the shoddier stonework is like on the top built at a later date? So there's like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I, I've been to Machu Picchu and you, I mean, what you described is exactly correct. I mean, it's the, 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 it, it is a it's almost like a typical uh, village hut of you know bricks like you and I could pick up but then assembled on yeah the, these yeah megalithic foundations it, it's clearly two, two, two separate things and yeah I, I, I when, when you look at it, it it's almost kind of like obvious and I, I think that the, one of the bigger mysteries to me with, with, with Machu Picchu is just how did they get this stuff up there? I mean, it's yeah. Machu Picchu when when you are when you're at the bottom of when you're at the the village that's at the bottom called uh, Ag uh, Aguas Calientes, um, and you look up and it's just this. It's like something from Avatar. It's like a, this cloud forest citadel, and you you catch a bus to get up there. It takes twenty mm -hmm. about twenty minutes on the bus to get up there, right. and apparently the stone came from like a long way away and that they've carted it up this mountain somehow this unbelievably steep mountain which is just grueling even to walk around because you're in this like it's just so humid and and stuff and so when you get up there um on certain days you are above the clouds I, i've got pictures of me with the clouds like kind of yeah, yeah. Un underneath me it, it's it's, <laughs> yeah. it's utterly spectacular um yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's again like what makes you you do these kind of things. Um, well, this this is this is one of the this is one of the mysteries of some of these ancient megalithic sites is their ability the, the the sheer scale of these mm -hmm. structures, their ability to move and lift and transport massive stones way bigger than anything that we move today. Uh, there is there are a number of sites in, in, in Peru. I mean, one is called uh, Saxe Juan, mm -hmm. uh, with these massive, massive like 200, 300 stone blocks that have been moved many miles. A lot of crazy examples of this in in Egypt, right? The pyramids have uh, these granite blocks in the king's chamber in the core of the pyramid that have been moved from Aswan Quarry like over 500 miles away. Mm -hmm. Block weighs like 50 to 70 tons. It's crazy. But one yeah, of the and then they got that block examples, up into the middle of the pyramid and then lowered it in, into place or something. Yeah, it's insane. Place it with exact precision. There, the craziest example, of the, or one of the craziest examples of this is, is a site called uh, Baalbek in Lebanon. Um, this is a, a, a really famous ancient megalithic site that won't look it up. It's spelled B-A-A-L-B-E-K, I think, Baalbek. And there are these uh, stone blocks that weigh around a thousand tons a thousand tons which like if you if you if you see like a human standing next to it, it's like this tiny human standing on top of these massive blocks like if you consider that a large suv weighs like you know two or three tons mm -hmm. then you're talking like 50 large su or sorry uh sorry 500 <laughs> large suvs in a in a single block right just, just, just truly gigantic. It's hard to even explain. You have to see the pictures, like people standing on top of this thing. But somehow they were able to uh, quarry this stone, move it multiple miles, then lift and place it with precision, mm -hmm. so that like it perfectly uh, aligns with the block underneath it and the the ones next to it. This is this is truly, truly exceptional uh, abilities. That very that are very strongly suggestive of this idea of of, of lost ancient uh, high technology, and I'm I'm not at all like I'm not one of those people who said like oh the aliens did aliens it. Like, it's all, aliens it's all, it's all ETs that's that's not my that's not my idea my idea is that like 
we know so little of the true history of planet Earth. Uh, the the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, right? And like humans have been around, <clears throat> humans have been around for like around 200,000 years. If the whole history of Earth was condensed into a 24 hour day, the entire story of humanity would be maybe a minute, like the last minute of a 24 hour day. So what this highlights is that there's 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 millions, billions of years of history uh, uh, that we claim to that we claim to know. We claim to know that we're the most advanced species that have ever been around on planet Earth. But uh, there is evidence that is very, very suggestive that at some point in time in, in, in the distant past, there were other builders that existed here who had abilities that are very, very difficult to explain. And I <clears throat> I do see an interesting like connection to psychedelics just in the sense that like I think I'm drawn to exploring these for similar reasons. One, because there's a great mystery here. Mm-hmm. And two, because by exploring uh, the evidence, this represents an opportunity to open our minds, right? To like yep. a bigger picture understanding of uh, – Reality, a bigger picture understanding of what it means to be a human here on planet Earth, a, a, a greater awareness of our place in the cosmos, the nature of reality, the nature of self, the nature of what it means to be alive. Right. So like that's what th- that's why I think I'm, I, I gravitate toward exploring these things. But um, yeah, I mean, like all over the world, there, there's just like books and books that could be written that have been written about some of these really mysterious sites. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the thing which I think I probably share the, the same kind of draw to it. And I think some of it is part of just that occult lure to it. You know, there, there is a mystery there. Um, and I think part of it is, and it's, it's something I get very strongly within sort of psychedelic experiences. I, I always get a very strong feeling of lineage, of, of, of sort of, connection through like ancestral connection and you know you you could you know if, if we wanted to take a very reductionist sort of view on it we could say that these this is just you know savages got some ideas in their head and they're just wasting the time making these things fine like we could let's go with that that's not what i think but let's just go with it um still you you get this when you look at one of these things and you know when i i've been lucky enough to see a few of these places so i've been to, to machu picchu mm-hmm. i've been to uh, a lot of, lot of places around Greece, like the Parthenon. Certainly, a bit to Stonehenge in England. Um, so I you know I've I've been around a few, and you 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 get a feel for being in somebody's shoes, somebody in the past who this meant everything. This meant so much to them that they poured, no doubt, blood and sweat, and you know possibly like you know the risk of starvation or. So something it, it meant something to put those calories into this this meant something to them right it's something they believed was going to en- enhance their lives in some way in some way they possibly couldn't fathom but they did it and it's right. yeah i i feel that there but no matter what what, what you think of, of like how how wrong or right they were it's a, a just a spectacular snapshot of some somebody just trying to comprehend the universe around them like mm. you know in, in mm. a time where you know particularly in you know if it's something in, in egypt where you know the, the sun will bake you alive or something like where you're in like stone engine england where the winter comes and it will just fuck you over you know you've got to you need this way to understand the seasons and understand the different and understand the land and just 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 what is going on with the land and the sky and you know, help me to understand that that when right. when the sun appears here, that then things are going to get better. And when the sun appears here, then I need to start, you know, making sacrifices. I need to start getting stuff ready. So, and and the fact that that these things do have all these sort of astronomical connections just shows how important this this thing is. Basically, like a map of your existence. It's like, right? Yeah, dude, it's springtime. Get shit ready. You know, it's and it's. I, I, yeah, to, to have that so condensed into this kind of like material form, but not just material, but but a place of 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 worship, a place where where it 
it you know you are you you're, you really are like offering your your sweat to existence itself i think it's a, it's just staggering even even just to take all the all the, the sort of the, the mysticalness out of it but yeah, then yeah. the fact the fact that you can then couple it with people you know that there are that the cultures where these things are found do tend to be these psychedelic cultures um right. then it just makes so much sense like yeah, yeah. I, I i can get what it would be like to be stood at the parthenon having gone through the kind of like the mysteries of eleusis and right. you know and, we, and again a lot of the same kind of things that you just talked about apply to like that the, the the sizes of the blocks in the parthenon are staggering the the most people like look at the sort of like the, the pillars that go up and all, all this, the stone relief work at the top, but the blocks upon which it's all sitting are mm, insane. Mm. Just mm. like, how did they get them up there and put them in place to even before they even started building these pillars on? And, you know, and, and the whole thing is made out of stone. So when you look right. at like the, the, the nice pictured relief, it's solid fucking stone. <laughs> like they, and they got it up there because it, it meant something to do it. And yeah, and just to sit there, and then you know, I think I've, I was recently reading uh, Brian Murakeshi's book of uh, the Immortality yep. Key, and he was talking about the sort of the, the kookie on which did this potentially psychedelic LSD-based beer that they or wine that they would drink, uh-huh. and yeah, I I would totally it can totally imagine that what it must look like to have the the veil between heaven and earth opened up before you in this sort of the most sacred temple. And yeah, you know, mm. people like Alexander the Great and all these kind of Roman emperors have, have sat there and gone through this ritual and came out saying, yeah, this is the most important thing ever. And yeah, I, I, I get it. And I think that's possibly somewhere where we're kind of going a little bit wrong at the moment mm-hmm. in that we don't quite have something baked into our society whereby we, we can just undertake a a ritual of pure meaning um, right we, we always you know it's i think we, we, we're getting we're getting back on the track with psychedelics and stuff we're, we're understanding what the, what these things are possible of but i think there's the bit i don't think we're fully on board with it yet is this idea that it, it there is something more to it than just getting i'm going to sound like a bit of a hippie now but i think i think the the structure or the the, the narrative and, and certainly the, the group connection thing. I mean, you, you kind of must have felt this on, on, on your retreats where you go through something together and you establish like a a brotherhood or a feeling of connection or a there's, there's something more to it than, than what I get just taking psychedelics in my bedroom. And that's not to belittle taking psychedelics in my bedroom. I love taking psychedelics in my bedroom. Mm. But doing this in a way which... You know, set and setting, and everything, which triggers a certain response. Like if you engineer right. it in a certain way to trigger a certain experience. In this case, you know, a, a, what, what you could only call like a religious experience or a sacred experience. Yeah, I get it. I think, and mm. and that makes total sense to me. Why you have these temple structures in Mexico, Peru, you know, uh, um, Egypt. You know, so, so yeah, it's it's sort of it, it, that. I think is a, a really seems kind of almost obvious now piece of the puzzle that's clicked into place from uh from uh, Murakeshu's stuff that's a, that's a real that's really beautifully said you know and and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the importance of the context in which psychedelics are taken i don't think that we can control the psychedelic experience but we can set the stage for mm. the experience to unfold and that's the context right and in that sense there is there are ways to almost architect the experience or engineer the experience towards experiences of uh, transcendence, of creativity, of greater connection. I think that's really at the core, and this is also, we were talking about this this uh, desire for connection, right? I think that's at the core of so many, uh, a lot of suffering in the world is a feeling of disconnect mm-hmm. from others, from, from life itself, from ourselves, and what I see in some of these ancient temples is humans, us little mere mortals walking around on planet Earth, connecting with something greater, connecting with something cosmic, connecting with something transcendent, connecting with something divine. And, and through these non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, actually experiencing that connection in a way that's beyond, uh, 
that's almost difficult to put into words, right? It's, it's, it's maybe fundamentally impossible to put into words. But in this sense, there is exactly like, exactly like you were saying, like there is a lot to be learned today in the modern times from examining this ancient wisdom. And some of these, the, the, these, these ancient modes of operating from people thousands of years ago, in some senses, they were more advanced than we are in some, in some senses, not necessarily technologically, but in, in, in their ability to, to uh, navigate these spaces, to architect these spaces, to connect, to uh, establish those, those connections. And, you know, today in the modern world, we have oceans of, of information. We have oceans of knowledge and just drops of wisdom right mm-hmm. drops of wisdom and i think again i think that is at at, at the very core of, of a lot of the conflict that's in the world i do see psychedelics in that sense as representing an ability for us to reestablish that connection those feelings of connectedness with life with uh you know what i could only call the sacredness of life uh, i think we've lost that even even for someone who is an atheist there's still a lot to be said about the sacredness of life, the utter astonishing miracle that it is simply to exist, that there is something rather than nothing, that this whole infinite universe has somehow self-organized over, you know, 13.8 whatever billion years of since the since the Big Bang. This is an astonishing, astonishing mystery miracle. And we are somehow embedded in the in the fabric of, of mm-hmm. all of this thing. Right. And many of us, we've, we've lost, we've lost that, that, that knowingness. We've lost that wisdom that there is this, uh, this deeper oneness rippling through life that we are an expression of, you know, ultimately the infinite source of, of life itself. And <clears throat> I think that having those experiences, psychedelics are not the only tool. They're not the only means, but they are a very, very powerful one. Um, Having these experiences of reconnection, that brings just so much more meaning into our life, so much more joy, so much more peace, so much more love to feel like we truly belong here, that we are a part of something greater, that we are a meaningful piece of life, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think just just, just a, like you say, I think just a part of, of the universe even, I think that that's where a lot of people get lost in it. We, we we get so caught in our own um mundanity that i mean like, like as you just kind of you know really beautifully sort of you know set out that would we, we are talking about some kind of you know almost like explosive waveform that can be traced back to sort of the beginning of time that's just fired out and here we are you know like i said we, we have assembled ourselves through just an insane numerical chance to be Rob and Jonas and the internet and you know all the people who are all here in the chat and it's it's miraculous and but yet we kind of worry about you know that the person in the shop was a bit of an asshole or you know or you know I, I can't afford you know the nice leather seats in the car that I really want and it's just so yep. ch- bollocks <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and and really we, ju- we just kind of yeah when you when you have one of these experiences just like i described with the, with the san pedro it it really does just kind of s- snap you out of it and just you know think it's yeah it makes, makes you reprioritize stuff but an interesting thing that, that, right. that came to mind when, when you were talking was um when i was just in in egypt and the, it, the when they would we were, you know, we were doing some like the guided tours and stuff like that through the Valley of the Kings, which I've got to yeah. say, out, out, of, um, out of one sort of thing that came up from this whole COVID thing, I, I got to Egypt, it was empty. Like the entire place was empty. Like it was like me, my wife and my kids were walking around like places where normally you would have to queue up for hours in the baking sun. And we were just like, if that's you, awesome. If I see, see any of our photos from Egypt, it's just us. It was <laughs> um, the, the like the guides were all like desperate for attention because we were the only people there. Uh, and so uh, yeah, but they, would, they they explained to us that the with with like the Valley of the Kings and there's, I think they've, there's like two hundred tombs they've, they've uncovered there and they're still finding more. And these are yep. the most elaborate. Yep. just insane sort of structures like going delving underground they're saying that diff- there were different phases of Egyptian building there was right. the underground phase 
and then there was a kind of like the ongoing phase and then the final phase was a pyramid phase of, of building upwards now whether that's accurate or not again there's, there's a lot of challenges to egyptian archaeology it's certainly right. got it's, uh, a, a a lot of um, ego thrown in there but they were they were describing um that the with the like the, the pharaohs or the or the upper classes their entire education was spiritual education for the transition to the next life right and they they could do that because they these are the elite but just it's such a flip on where we are today where yeah. everything is about no do do what you want no and then you get to the point of your death and shit your pants because you're not ready right. for it whereas right. this was the complete opposite it was all about be ready be ready for this moment and like like we talked about the the buildings are aligned for this moment everything's you know everything's True. pointing yeah. at the, you yeah. know the, you've got like sort of almost like gun barrels pointed at certain stars to take you right to, your, right. to the destination you need to be at and yeah it, it's it's you know, it's it's every all the kind of the stuff that we talk about in as though it's like something modern where we say, oh, you know, we're like end of life care and all this. It's like, yeah, their entire life was like end of life care. They were they were getting ready for their moments of death. They were their entire life was almost right. getting ready to face death. Now you could say that was maybe that was perhaps a bit too far. We we don't know what that culture looked like, but it's still it's a very um interesting contrast with how we are now because we just yeah. sweep, sweep it under the rug like we're immortal right. until it's like shit <laughs> here it comes and um so true yeah. so true it's almost like taboo to talk about death and dying right and yeah yeah go yeah, to a dinner I, party yeah. and say that you'll you'll everyone <laughs> soon, soon clear the room <laughs> yeah anyone anyone here thinking about our our imminent death right now <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, but uh, it's true. I mean, there is there's something to be said about uh, confronting our death in a meaningful way in order to cultivate more gratitude and appreciation for what we do have right now already, mm. and and for 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 the the relationships in our lives, for for the love, for, for and, and 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 to really like drill down to what's meaningful. To what's important to us, you know, like this, 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 this thought exercise of like, if we are on our deathbed, like what regrets might we have, or like, um, you know, what, what is it in in the in those final moments? I mean, any moment could be a final moment. That's really important to us. Yeah, that's really <laughs> meaningful to us. You know, this is this is this is a way of of increasing self awareness, of of becoming more conscious, of living more consciously. And uh, living with more gratitude, right? Finding, finding the beauty in, in the small things and, and not this just uh, material obsessed world that we live in where it's mm-hmm. all about accumulation, right? Like none of this stuff is coming to the afterlife, right? Although to be fair, the Egyptians did like stock their tombs. Uh, gold, yeah, yeah. Right? Like gold. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, come on, like none of this stuff is, is coming to the afterlife with us. Um, if there, if there is such a thing, if you believe in such a thing. So again, it's about, it's about like getting clarity about mm. like, what is this all about? Like, like w- in, now that I am here, like what is, what is the way to make the most of this, this fleeting ephemeral experience? Right. Yeah. But also you, you, you choose to then face your death on your own terms because it you know psychedelics are often referred to as like a, a mini death it's you know right. you can have these kind of right. ego death experiences yes so you're you're finding the courage to to do that and if you can do that then uh, you know the kind of theory would go then that, that the real event would then be less of a um of, of a traumatic event for right. you and if you can face your your death and then also at that point work out well, what are my regrets? What are my um, what are the things I want to change? And I can change them now because yes. I'm not going to be able to change them when I'm 85, and you know that's that that time's gone then. So this is, I think, again another thing where psychedelics are proving so useful is that you know take the opportunity, grasp your sort of you know grasp you know the, the challenges that are before you, and and do something about it. You yeah. you can yeah. you can change your you know your path. You can. Um, you know, don't be afraid to look into the darkness of yourself because this this will this is the sort of the chance to fix it. And you don't right. want to be that guy on the deathbed, just full of regret and full right. of like sh- like shit. It's all gone. I can't do anything about it. Like you want to be the person like okay, that went as 
well as it can. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, so true. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons I love it. Um, yeah, I remember we're coming up to the sort of 90 minutes mark there, mate. So I think this is probably a good place to, uh, to tie it up. Just before we do, do you want to, is there anything you want to sort of point uh, people at? Is there a place to, to find you? Or, or perhaps, you know, you want, you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, you said you're going back on the, to the, the centre in Jamaica. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, if anyone would like to, to check out me and my work, uh, I have a YouTube channel called Cosmic Consciousness with Jonas. Uh, I also have a website called innervisionpsychedelics.com where uh, you can schedule a free one-on-one -on -one meeting with me there. Um, I offer uh, coaching and consulting around all aspects of the psychedelic experience, and I'm always happy to talk um, about psychedelics, mysteries of life, consciousness, all, the, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, the, the retreat center where I'm working in Jamaica is called Myco Meditations. Um, if anyone has any questions about that or what you know, what an, uh, a retreat is like, uh, feel free to, again, um, you know, reach out to me um, or, or schedule an appointment with me. With me. Uh, yeah, always, always love to connect. And, you know, especially in the, in the, in the psychedelic community, I think it's so, it's so important that we're, we're there for each other. You know, like that was a, that was a big challenge um, for me when I first started exploring this stuff is feeling sort of isolated, you know, feeling, feeling mm -hmm. lonely, feeling like I didn't have people to talk to. Um, and, and process these really profound and really intense, sometimes very challenging experiences. So um, I think it's important that we're always there for each other. So, yeah. Totally agree, mate. Couldn't have said it better myself. And I'm so, you can always talk to me, mate. You can always give me a shout. And, uh, and in fact, I'd love to talk to you again, mate. When you get back from your retreat, give us a shout and let's, uh, let's catch up again. And uh, everybody, yes, everyone who's, who's been in the comments, thanks so much uh, for all, all your comments. And uh, yeah, just give it up for Jonas. I think he's been a great guest. And uh, mate, I've loved catching up with you. And uh, I think we, we probably could have done like another couple of hours going on with these these ancient civilizations. So there's a reason to catch up <laughs> oh, again yeah. next time. So yes, yes, absolutely. Rob, thank you so very much. It's my Always pleasure. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Really appreciate you and all your videos, all your work. And thank you to everyone in the comments section, everyone who's who's been watching along. Yeah, much love. Much love to everyone. Cool. Well, peace, brother. And uh, yeah, enjoy your treat, mate. And I look forward to hearing all about it. All right. All right. Take care. Take care, mate. Bye. Peace. Bye.